Good morning. You know, this morning uh, was a different morning for me. Every greeting I got was, are you ready? I'm praying for you. And uh, several of you actually pray for me, and I really appreciate that. And I can sense the prayer. I can sense God leading me this morning. I got to say that what a joy for me to stand before my church family of 25 years to proclaim the Word of God. At the same time, what a fear it is for me to stand before you as the pastor we intern to proclaim the Word of God. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We ask simply, simply, that you speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. On February 7, 1996, Liza Bailey, Thomas Miller, Christopher Cole committed one of the most horrific crimes in Tampa, Florida history. They killed three innocent 18-year-old young men for no reason at all. The three killers confessed to the horrific crime. But the funny thing is, they were not even at the crime scene when the three teens died. You see? The killers simply removed the stop sign at a rural intersection few hours earlier. The three unsuspecting teenagers riding in the white Chevy Camaro breezed through an intersection into the path of an eight-ton truck. Three lives lost just because someone removed a stop sign. Stop signs are warning signs. Warning signs are meant to warn us of danger. In the Bible, God posted many warning signs for our instruction. And there's one particular warning sign posted on the tombs of the lost generation that I would like to draw your attention to this morning. The lost generation experienced the incredible power and blessings from God, and yet that was not enough to motivate them to fully follow God. They have so much potential, but for their foolishness, their lives ended in shame. I'm talking about the generation God delivered out of Egypt, but failed to enter into the promised land. This morning, we're looking into the book of, World, uh, book of Numbers 13 and 14. Please open your Bible to that. We will learn what went wrong. How could the same people that crossed the Red Sea fail to enter into Canaan? What lessons can we learn from the generation of people who forfeited the blessings of the promised land. The book of Numbers is a diary of Israel's early days of covenant relationship with God. It emphasized the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. It warns us about the necessity of obedience and the tragedy of disobedience. This tragic story began when God delivered his people out of the bondage of Egypt, deliverance at the Red Sea. God guided the Israelite by cloud, with cloud by day and fire by night. Throughout the journey, God provided and protected his people. Then God called his people to camp at Mount Sinai, where God organized these former slaves into a unified community of people for battle, 
to take the whole, to take the promised land, to for worship. And after two years, they were ordered to march to, toward Canaan, the promised land. At Kadesh Barnea, on the border of Canaan, the promised land, the people of God did not, did not want to enter the promised land. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Consequently, God let them wander 40 years until everyone in that generation died in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. This first generation delivered out of Egypt should have been God's faithful witness to the nations. Instead, they became synonymous for faithlessness, disobedience, defeat, and lost opportunity. They became the lost generation. Now, so what did the did Israel do at the at Kadesh that brought about the shameful end? To put it simply, they grumbled and rebelled against God throughout the Exodus journey. And the, in, at the incident at Kadesh Barnea was just the final act that caused God to set them aside for the rest of their lives. The sat in, at Kadesh was the result of three sins. One, doubting God's word. Two, discouraging God's people. And finally, defying God's will. These three sins caused them to spend the rest of their lives wandering around, just waiting to die. A sad end to a glorious beginning. They were the lost generation. They are the warning sign. The book of Numbers 13 to verses 1 to 25 is a long passage. You can read it while I'll summarize it for you. In Numbers 1 to 25, God told Moses to select 12 leaders to spy out the promised land and gave explicit instructions on where and what to look for in this spying mission. The spies faithfully followed God's instruction and spied the land for 40 days. If you only read Numbers 13, it seemed the spy mission was God's idea. But when you read Deuteronomy 1, verses 21 to 23, you get a very different story. Please keep your, keep your finger in the book of Numbers and turn to, to the next book, Deuteronomy the 1, verse 21 to 23. Deuteronomy 1 is about the account of Moses retelling the history of the first generation to the new generation that came out of Egypt after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Let me just read to you Deuteronomy 1, 21 to 23. The Lord your God had placed the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me and said, Let us send men before, the, before us, that they may search out the land for us, and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up, and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and took twelve, twelve men, one man for each tribe. In Deuteronomy, we learn that it was the people that first asked Moses to send the spies out to the land. To harmonize the apparent contradiction, commentators have concluded that after God told the people to go up to take the land, people asked Moses to send the spies first. Moses then asked God for permission and God's answer came in Numbers 13, 1-3. to 
The mere fact that the Israelites wanted to spy out the lands showed that they doubted God's word. That was the first sin toward becoming the lost generation. Even though that appears that it was God, even though it appears that God was letting the Israelites have their own way, not because the way was right, but because he wanted to teach them a lesson. He wanted them to know their own heart, how disobedient they really were. Practically speaking, sending the spies was not a bad military strategy. But the problem is that it was rooted in doubting God's word. When we see the request for the spy mission in light of how God delivered his people out of Egypt, and how they were repeatedly reminded of the promised land that God had sworn to give to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we affirm the promises through Moses. And even more, the Lord had just reminded the people of his promise when they broke camp at Mount Sinai. And again, when they arrived at Kadesh, all that assurance and reassurance from God was still not enough for the Israelite to simply trust God and his word. My son purchased a house in Placentia last year. At the completion of that purchase, a title deed was given to him. God's promise was the title deed to the land of Israel. And his word was the guarantee that would defeat his enemy. God's promise was all Israel needed. But the nation doubted God's word. How seriously do we take God's word? Do we really trust God and his word? The lost generation of the Israelites is a reminder to us today that it is a dangerous thing to doubt God's word and to trifle with the will of God. We may end up spending the rest of our lives wandering, wandering around just waiting to die. Doubting God's word was the first sin toward becoming the lost generation. The second sin is discouraging God's people. Verses 26 to 23, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and they brought back words to them and to all the congregation showed them the fruit of the land. Just thus they told him and said, we went into, into the land where you have sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified, and very large, and, and the people are very large, and more where we saw descendants of Enoch there. Amalek is living in the land of Nagaf, and the Hittites of Jebusite and the Amorites are living in the hill country. The Canaanites are living by the sea, by the, by the side of Jordan. Then Caleb Quiet of the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, and we shall surely overcome it. But the men who have gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad port of the land, which they have spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the son of Anak, a part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, as though we were in their sight. The spies discouraged people, discouraged God's people with their report. Someone once said, a committee is a group of people who individually can do nothing. 
and collectively decide nothing can be done. That was a committee of the ten spies. Individually, they can do nothing, and collectively, they decided nothing can be done for the promised land. In verses 26 to 29, even though they faithfully carry out God's instruction in spying out the land, and that, but their fear was hidden just, just below the surface. They reported accurately what they saw on the land, but with a pessimistic eyes. The pessimism showed through in that how the ten spies identified Canaan at the land to which you send us. And the land through which we have gone, but not as the land of the Lord our God is giving us. Because these ten men were walking by sight, they didn't really believe God's promise. They looked at the people of the land, they saw giants. They looked at the Canaanite city and saw high walls and locked gates. They looked at themselves and saw grasshoppers. In verse 30, Caleb senses the pessimism and jumped in, exhorting the people to take the land. Then true, the true color of the ten spies came out, and they rebuked Caleb, exaggerated the condition of the land, saying the land devours people, exaggerated the strength of the people, people by saying, uh, saying the pre-flood mighty Nephilim descendants lived there. This is impossible. Because the Nephilim were killed in the flood. Now with a bad report from the ten spies, fear and discouragement quickly spread throughout the camp. The ten spies used fear to discourage God's people. Now here's a great lesson for leaders, for leadership. What we say and do matters. It is a great sin to doubt God's word, but it is a greater sin for us to cause others to doubt God's word. What we say and do matters. You might say, well, I'm not a leader. If you are a Christian, you're a leader. You lead in your family and in your workplace. You have responsibility to lead others to Christ. You have influence over people. How we stand on God's word can encourage or discourage the people around us. It is a great sin when we doubt God's word. But it is even a greater sin when we cause others to doubt God's word. Don't be a discourager to God's people. The lost generation sinned by doubting God's word then discouraged, discouraged God's people and finally defying God's will. Chapter 14, verses 1 to 10, Then all the generation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, would that we should we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little one would become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader to return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on the faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, those who spy out the land, tore the clothes. They spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he shall bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear, but, but all the congregation set to stone with stone. Stone them with stone. 
In the first ten verses of chapter 14, the poison of unbelief and discouragement spread like wildfire in the camp. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the, and the people wept that night. The next day, the whole congregation criticized Moses and Aaron and lamented the fact that the nation had perished in Egypt or in the wilderness. You know, when our eyes on ourselves and our own circumstances, we lose perspectives and say the most ridiculous and say and do the most ridiculous things. The entire nation weeping over a plight that they had caused by their own unbelief. They didn't admit their own failing. Instead, they blamed God and decided to choose a new leader to return to Egypt. I know, I know what some of you are thinking. You say, well, God seems rather unreasonable. Why did God want the Israelites to go into the promised land that are fortified with fierce warriors? You wouldn't want to send your husband or son to war. On the surface, God seems unreasonable. But according to Deuteronomy 8, 2, it was all part of God's preparation and test of his people. And we must remember how God had left the Israelite out of Egypt. Israel has seen what the Lord did to the Egyptians and the Amalekites. And they have every assurance that God would never, never, Pharaoh's people. Think about this. Would you doubt God if you are right if you're right in the middle of seeing God bring the Israelite out of Egypt with the plagues bearing down the Egyptians one after another? Now if you if you and you were there where the people were freaking out, seeing the mighty Egyptian army thundering in the iron chariots and horses towards you. And that and you have nowhere to go when you're back to the Red Sea. Just when you thought all is lost, God intervened again, this time with a wind so powerful, more powerful than you've ever seen, blowing all night. God parted the Red Sea and delivered you from Pharaoh's army once and for all. These Israelites were eyewitness, were eyewitnesses to the whole Exodus event. A faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. And God tests our faith to help us make sure it is genuine and to help make it grow. Let me say that again. A faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. And God tests our faith to help us make sure it is genuine and to help make it grow. On November 3rd of this year, millions watch Nick Valenda successfully walk across two Chicago skyscrapers, 50 stories high, on a tightrope, with no safety net, with no safety harness. After his, after his walk, a Christian reporter asked if he was tempting God with these dangerous stunts in acrobat. Well, then the Connie answer, you know I don't. Don't we walk by faith, not by sight? This morning, this is something that I have been, I have trained for in my entire life. I have trained to walk the wire since I was two. 
If I, if I were not to trade at all, and I'm going to walk the city of Chicago blindfolded, that would be tempting God. Now, whether you believe Walanda is tempting God or not is another matter. But you know, you know his faith in his ability to walk across the skyscraper has been tested over and over again until he was absolutely sure that absolutely no doubt that he could walk across the skyscraper, even blindfolded. He's a good example of someone that had their faith tested by fire. Only when faith is tested, we know it is real. God wants to test the Israelites' faith to help them grow in their faith. That is why God told the people to take the promised land. Now back to the lost generation. They wanted to choose a new leader and return to Egypt. This is open, outright rebellion against the will of God. There were only four men of faith in the camp. Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua. They tried to change the situation. Moses and Aaron fell on their face and fell on their faces, interceded with God, but Caleb and Joshua spoke to the people and assuring them that Jewish people, the Jewish army could easily take the land because God was with them. These men saw the nation's sin for what it was, rebellion against God. Doubting God's word led to discouraging God's people. Discouraging God's people led to defying God's will. Defying God meant death for the ten spy and the people. The ten spies were killed when Moses interceded for the people once again. And once again, the mercy of God was demonstrated by sparing the people. Even though God spared the people, they will not be able to enter the promised land. Everyone from the age 20 and up, will wander in the wilderness, waiting to die. That was the lost generation. How are we like the lost generation? We're not like the lost generation in that we're trying to get into the promised land. For the New Testament believers, the people of God now includes all those who are the sons of Abraham by faith. Canaan has become an image of a better country, according to Hebrews 11.16. That is a heavenly one, a new Jerusalem from which sin and death are no more. But while we are still on earth, God is not done with us. God is still working in our hearts. In the wilderness, God, God's test revealed unequivocally the heart of the Jews never left Egypt, even though their bodies were one step away from the promised land. Where are we this morning? We know Jesus Christ has set us free from sin and death. But do our hearts still long for the old way of life? Do we still yearn for Egypt in our heart? In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul refer, referred to the wilderness generation as an example for Christians. Paul warns us of idolatry, fear of men versus the fear of God, knowing God's promise, but doubting God's power in our lives. And these are the same, very same issues that we deal with every, in every stage of our lives. How are we like the lost generation? We are like the lost generation in that we have a choice to obey or disobey His words. We have a choice to trust God without all or not. 
We have a choice in what we do with the idols in our lives. We have a, we have a choice to fear man or to fear God. We have a choice to claim God's promise and believe that God is working powerfully in our lives or not. How we respond to God, we determine the course of our journey on earth. Will it be a spiritually fruitful and rewarding journey, or will, will it be a journey wandering in the land of self gratification, just waiting to die. You know, every new stage in life is God's test for you and me. Every, new, every stage in life comes with blessings and challenges that God wants us to occupy for His glory. For the collegians, God puts the arena of adulthood and career before you to test you. Will you put God first in your studies, career, and relationship? God wants you to be victorious in that arena for His glory. For the young Mary, the arena of marriage and parenting is before you. Will your marriage and family exemplify Christ or crucify Christ? God wants you to exit that arena more like Christ before you enter into it. Every stage in life holds both great blessings and challenges. Where are you this morning? What life stage are you in? Some of us are in our midlife stage where our careers are fairly stable. Our marriage is not perfect, but that's fine. Perhaps our children have grown and perhaps we are now experiencing the empty nest. Going to church is a part of life even though we no longer have that passion that we once had to serve God. But that's fine too. Let the young people take over. For some, as we are approaching the retirement years, we find ourselves facing new sets of fears. We find ourselves spending more and more time checking our investment portfolio. We're concerned we are more concerned with the rising cost of living, health care, and availability of Social Security. We worry about we have enough money to retire. As companies are downsizing, we worry about getting laid off at the latter stage of our careers. For some, we have no financial concerns because we are smarter than others in our bank account shows it. And we're looking forward to slow way down on everything to focus on the leisurely life. We're looking forward to spend a lot more money on the finer things in life. We're obsessed about eating well, eating healthy, exercising and staying young. We strategize how to improve our golf games and looking for looking high and low to find that best deal for the next vacation or cruise. In every stage of life, the luring signs of the world, the flesh, and the devil are always flashing before our eyes. If we do not keep our eyes on Christ, the lure will cause us to doubt God's word discourage God's people, and defy God's will. We will forget God and want to return to Egypt. Every stage of life tempts us to walk by sight and not by faith. 
Walking by sight will cause us to be self-obsessed, self-centered, self-focused, self-absorbed, and self-serving. When we are self-consumed, nothing matters except taking care of self and the people we care about. And that is the problem of the lost generation. Numbers 14.3, the lost generation says, Why is the Lord bringing us in this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and the little ones will become plundered. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? In their heart was fear. Fear of man, fear for the family, but no fear for God. When they are not looking up, all they can see is the self-interest. Facing life's challenges and changes are unsettling and scary. But do you see every stage of life as God's preparation for you to serve Him in the kingdom to come? For me, I'm 60 years old. I'm a pastor intern by choice. It has been 10 plus years of preparation for me to do what God has called me to do. Some say I'm a fool behind my back. You know what I say? I'm not a fool, but I am scared. I'm scared that I may not finish well. But I believe God has prepared me to end this stage of my life with great challenges and blessings. And by faith I will step into it. And by faith I will choose not to be afraid. By faith I choose not to look inward, but look upward. By faith I choose not to shrink back from serving the Lord. Instead of slowing down, I can see my finish line clear. I can sprint rather than jog. What about you? What does God call you, call you to do? You have a ministry right, be, right where you are at work, at your workplace. Be bold. Start or lead a lunchtime Bible study at your workplace. Be courageous and lead a short-term mission team to Indonesia. Be a mentor to a young family struggling with issues of marriage and children. Be a coach to a college grad looking to enter the workforce. Be the Christian role model if, of a father or mother that some young man and young woman never had. You know, I sit next to Pastor uh, John Sito. The need in a young adult discipleship is tremendous. He has trouble keeping up with the premarital counseling and the one-on-one -on -one counseling. He needs help. We're not too old. We're not too old. We can all be Caleb's and come alongside the young Joshua's of our church for the glory of God. If you are older, your greatest ministry lies in your faithfulness to pray. You wield the most powerful spiritual weapon on earth. Sanctify yourself and pray for the pastors and the leaders. Pray for the missionaries and the teachers. Pray for our country. Pray for the world and pray for your family. A prayer warrior can be powerful even when he has trouble walking. I'm here because someone prayed for me. There was a time when 
Polly and I were <laughs> far from God. But her, her sister Stella pray for us. God answered her prayers. Apostle Paul <clears throat> said in Philippians 3, 13 to 14, Brethren, let do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Press on toward a goal. We don't stop running. Great runners do not slow down nearing the finish line. They run through the finish line. Do you have fear that you cannot make it to the finish line? I do. But I believe in every stage of life, God calls us to step up to the challenge and follow him fully. Follow him fully fully, and trust him to do the heavy lifting for us. Deuteronomy one thirty says, The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just as it did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carry you just as a man carries his son in all the way you have walked until you came to this place. When we are weak, God is strong. He carries us like a man carries his son. What a picture. Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, your own nature will turn you inward and self-focused. You will not finish well. You are in danger of becoming the lost generation. You are in danger of wandering aimlessly in the land of self-gratification, just waiting to die. Let me be a Caleb to you this morning. Let me encourage all of us to run toward the Heavenly Father with faith and not with fear. Don't spend the rest of your lives wandering around just waiting to die. Don't be like the lost generation. For the people that don't know the Lord, let me tell you the Lord knows you and he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for your sin and mine. You need his forgiveness. We all need his forgiveness. In this Christmas season, this is an awesome reminder and an awesome warning sign. It is an awesome reminder and an awesome warning sign that he sent his son. 2,000 years ago, as a baby, who died on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. He is my Savior, and He can be your Savior. Call to the Lord while He may be found. Confess your sins and tell Him you want to come out of the wilderness, but don't know how. And He will send his spirit into your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that is searching every heart and drawing people to yourself. May we run strong and fully follow after you. May we never doubt your word, discourage your people, or define your will. For we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.